Welcome to Crawl Space. I'm Tim here today with Lance. Lance, how are you today? I am doing fantastic today, Tim, of course, because our guest is a return guest who always brings an amazing conversation to the table. So that makes me feeling pretty good. I think the listeners are going to enjoy this. I would love to know first, though, how you are doing. I'm doing great. Thanks a lot for asking. Yeah, I'm excited to introduce this conversation with old friend James Renner. And he's got a new book that's called Little Crazy Children about the 1990 unsolved murder of 16-year-old Lisa Pruitt. And this book, Lance, is excellent. We both listened to the audiobook version, and uh, it is a captivating mystery. Yeah, definitely pick up this book wherever you get your books. And if you want to do both, the audio is really great. Like you said, James does the narration. So if you are a fan of James's podcast and you just like his speaking style, it's the perfect complement to the story. Listening to him, who experienced this investigation firsthand, obviously, tell you this story. So that makes it resonate a little bit more, I think, uh, for me anyway. But the murder of Lisa Pruitt is really like an Americana style who done it and leaves you baffled and angry and James really captures the emotion of that community at the time and it's a story of bullying it's a story of people who are elitists and then he, James gets personal too which he does in all of his books and I think like each book that he releases he gives you a little bit more personal information that in some I guess weird way contributes to the story he's telling it gives the motivation behind his storytelling so definitely give this one a, a shot and you can check out james's writing on his website at jamesrenner.com and lance if folks want to hear this episode ad free they can now subscribe to crawl space premium that is available on apple podcasts but if you're not an apple user you can go to crawlspace.supportingcast.fm and sign up for crawl space premium there you get ad free episodes early releases and our weekly bonus show and it's all bundled with missing which is another one of our podcasts and the new podcast from crawl space media dark valley well, thank you for telling me that, Tim. I am frantically writing it down. I probably missed something, so in future episodes, I'll probably ask you again. Or just to make things easier, I'll go to the show notes. Perfect. And I'll click right over. But, Tim, I have no idea where people can find us on social media. Can you fill, fill me in here? Well, while you're in the show notes, just click the links to our social media. You can follow us at Crawl Space Podcast or Crawl Space Pod. Thanks a lot for listening, everybody. We're going to break quick for commercial here, and we'll be right back with James Renner. James Renner, welcome back to the podcast. How are you today? <laughs> I'm, I'm doing well. I'm doing well. It's been a while. Long time no see. Oh, there we go. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to thank the Academy. <laughs> they love you. They love you here at the uh, live studio audience that we have at the Crawl Space Studios. Um, fantastic having you back on. Uh, we've been really wanting you to come back on to talk about your latest book. But in the meantime, once again, thank you. And what have you been up to? What's uh, What's the world of James Renner like at this point in 2023? <laughs> well, um, I am writing a lot. I, I just had the new book come out uh, a few weeks ago, and I, I went on a little tour. I visited bookstores in Columbus and Pittsburgh, Manchester, New Hampshire, and uh, Albany, and then New York City. I had my first signing in the city, which was a lot of fun, at a place called The Mysterious Bookshop in the Lower West Side. And uh, the bookstore is run by a very famous um, uh, editor, true crime journalist, um, Otto Penzler. And uh, when I was a reporter starting out at Cleveland Scene, he took one of my articles and uh, put it in one of his collection of, of true crime stories for that year. Uh, and it was the first time that um, I, I was recognized at that level. And so it was really cool to come full circle and uh, have a signing at his bookstore for this one. Um, and uh, I've got a contract with the same publisher 
for two more true crime books. And I've just finished the manuscript for the book that'll come out next year, which is about the Boy Scouts. And uh, the summer I spent as a camp counselor uh, in 95, where a young man ended up dead under mysterious circumstances. It's kind of the most personal thing I've written by far. And, um, you know, in a way, it kind of an origin story. You know, it's the first like investigation I really did at like age 17. I'm anxious to get that out there. It's, you know, if you thought true crime addict was personal, this one is, it, it, it um, ramps it up, you know, to 11, I'd say. You went there with it being personal. You're, you you mentioned your your new book, Little Crazy Children. Um, and then I, I held up a copy of that. I just want to give a shout out to White Lamb Books. That's our local bookstore here in the town I live. Walked into this little bookstore, a little independently run bookstore, and there it was, bam, just on display. So nice. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know what strings you pulled to make that happen in <laughs> in small town Massachusetts, but they had it there on display. Tim and I both listened to the book because we really wanted to feel like you were in the room with us, like talking us through oh, great. the story, um, <laughs> which is fantastic. But seeing that just on display means like you have to, it had to be purchased. You know, it was there. There was a stack of them right there. So just had to do that. Thank you. No. Well, it's a very new thing um, for my books to end up on um, on display. I mean, that hasn't happened um, with any of the other books. So, you know, I, I I don't I don't know. I think um, you know, true crime is still a big thing, and and uh, it's there wasn't a lot of true crime books coming out at the time, and you know, it's a it's a really good publisher, and they're helpful with that. And um, so, yeah, no, I, I I'm I'm excited every time I. I hear from people that see it in the stores because that's that's very new. Cool. Well, yeah, congrats on the book. It is great. And it is about the 1990 murder of Lisa Pruitt from Shaker Heights, Ohio. So you mentioned you're from Ohio. So is that how you first heard of the story? Yeah, this, this is one of those cases that kind of has always stuck with me um, over the years uh, in in some ways, it might be one of the things that inspired me to become a, a reporter and journalist uh, because I remember it was uh, in 2000 and I was a, still a student at Kent State University. I graduated in 2000 and I remember studying for finals and, uh, you know, I could the closest like fast food joint to my dorm was... Um, with uh, within walking distance was Taco Bell, and I walked over there. And along the way, I saw one of the uh, scene kiosks for scene is our like village voice paper in uh, Northeast Ohio. And Lisa Pruitt's picture was on the front page. It was in the display, and so I picked it up and took it to Taco Bell. Never got any real studying done because I I read this in depth article. And a couple things about that experience. One, it was the first time I really understood what new journalism was reading this. It was like a 6,000 word, you know, article, you know, five or six pages long. And it took me a couple of hours to really delve into it. And uh, I just fell in love with that way of writing and, and that, that form of journalism where you could really settle in and tell a story and uh, write about these these people, and you know they're they're kind of fully developed uh, on the page. And I also the other thing was I I disagreed with the author's conclusion. He he uh, and he was a really he's a really good writer named Ted Schwartz, and I eventually befriended him, and uh, he's written like thirty books, and um, but. Towards the end, it's very obvious that he comes to think that Kevin Young did it. And Kevin Young was the young man who was charged with the crime and then acquitted. And I saw so many other avenues and and red flags and circumstantial evidence that I came away thinking Kevin was totally innocent. And um, so it was me kind of falling in love with that sort of writing and then also... Uh, realizing that I would have done it differently. And that was a good combination. So it was one of the things that inspired me to think about stories like that and then eventually start 
submitting stories to scene um, to, to, to write for them too. And uh, yeah, I eventually ended up working at scene. And in 2008, I wrote my own cover story on that same unsolved murder. You know, it was eight years later, still unsolved. I went back into it and I saw a lot of circumstantial evidence that suggested the most likely suspect was Lisa's boyfriend. We can talk more in detail about that case. Um, but uh, it still didn't feel complete. It still felt like I was missing a part of it. And so even even after that article came out in 2008, I, I, every once in a while I'd put in a public records request for police reports or prosecutors' notes or anything I could get, the trial transcripts. And over the years, I amassed over, I think, like 2,000 pages of, of documents. And I just kept them in a box. I, I didn't have enough time to really delve into it. Uh, flash forward to uh, a few years later, many years later, uh, and I, I had a really, uh, I had a great opportunity going on where I was writing a pilot for Fox based on an article that I'd written on two women that were solving crimes using genetic genealogy. We were going to turn it into a show that was kind of like Monk, kind of like Bones in a way, hopefully smarter. <laughs> and uh, we um, got greenlit. We, we cast the thing. We got Melissa Leo to star in it, which was huge. She's got an Academy Award, great act actor. And uh, Tate Donovan and a couple other really cool actors involved. And we all moved down to New Orleans. And I was planning on being there for the next couple months, shooting this thing and then and working and hopefully building it out into a series where, you know, we live down there. And uh, we got ramped up and principal photography was supposed to start uh, March 13th, 2020. And they brought us into the office and said, hey, they're closing down the city. We got to send everybody home. Don't worry. It's only going to be two weeks. This is just a little cold. And of course, it's the beginning of COVID and two weeks became two years. And so that all kind of fizzled out. But what happened was it, it, it put me back in Ohio in lockdown with nothing to do. My whole schedule completely cleared. And I'm like, what do I do? And I, I started thinking about those boxes and those police reports. And I realized if I was ever going to write a book about this case, it was now. And so I opened them up and I had two intentions going into writing this book. One was to clear Kevin Young's name in the court of public opinion, because I've never thought he did it. And two, show that the boyfriend was the most likely suspect. And what I didn't expect to happen it was about two weeks into my report, my my research, I realized that there was another young man who was at the scene of the crime the night of the murder. And once I started looking into his background, man, all this dark stuff came out. And um, suddenly I, I came to believe that both Kevin Young and the boyfriend, Dan Dreifert, were innocent. Wow. That, that's a lot, <laughs> a lot in this story right there. Right. Um, thank you for laying that out. Um, I, w I want to ask about Shaker Heights. Um, what was Shaker Heights like back then in 1990, especially for someone who was Lisa Pruitt's age? And then can you take us through some of the other characters in this case? Because uh, I know there are a lot of names. I just want to want our audience to have that uh, basis before we go. Too yeah, far. sure. Um, Shaker Heights is a weird town. It's on the eastern side of Cleveland. It's part of greater Cleveland. And it's just past the ghetto, like the really rough part of town. Suddenly you're in this like bucolic, you know, perfect little town out of Pleasantville or something. Um, to the east, you have high-end apartment stores in Beechwood. To the south, you have your workaday suburbs, your blue-collar towns. And to the north, you have kind of this post-college town called Cleveland Heights. But Shaker Heights is in the middle of all this, and it's separate. It's this like weird little utopia in the middle of everything. And um, it's the home of like doctors and lawyers and rich entrepreneurs and the in 1990, when this 
murder took place, it you know what what you have really is a group of teenagers that kind of have the run of the town. You know, these entitled teenagers of these these rich parents that live in in mansions and there's this whole other world going on under the surface of what you see this this world of of teenagers in 1990 and um you know it's the beginning of you know it's it's punk maybe the very beginning of grunge um you've got you know these rock and roll venues up in up in cleveland heights and so you've got all this culture going on but um you know what you come to see when you really delve into the lives of the teenagers at the time is, is rampant drug use, um, promiscuity, you know, as if, you know, everybody was a teenager at one time, but it was at a level that really wasn't going on in many other suburbs. You know, that's the stage and the, the crime itself, you know, Lisa Pruitt was 16 years old and the day of her murder, which uh, was, you know, kind of begins on Thursday, September 13th, and she was murdered around 1230 in the morning, which is early morning hours of the 14th, a Friday. You know, everybody that I talked to said she was, you know, this perfect to a fault um, young woman. And, you know, we have heard that before, and I didn't believe it before. And, and But in this case, I think it was true. You know, Lisa was part of her youth church group. She was a mentor through her church. She was a musician. She was a compulsive writer. She was writing all the time. Um, And uh, I think she would have probably been a successful author. That time and location produced a couple well-known authors. Uh, Lisa's best friend at the time was a woman, uh, at the time she was 16 herself, a young woman named... uh, Catherine Schultz, who now works for the New Yorker and has won a Pulitzer Prize for her writing. And um, there was a young, uh, there was a girl a few years younger than her named Celeste Ng, who went on to write Little Fires Everywhere. So it was, um, I think Lisa would have been a writer in her own right. And um, anyways, that that day uh, was one of Lisa's best days ever. It was like a a perfect day uh, because she just got a driver's license. She passed the test that that day. They were celebrating. They're also celebrating the fact that her boyfriend, Dan Dreifert, reunited with her. They were were like a Romeo and Juliet kind of really uh, intense relationship and love. And he had been gone for a month because he had been committed to a um, psychiatric facility at the Cleveland clinic. And he just got out that day and they made plans for Lisa to sneak out of her house and ride to his house on her bike after midnight that night. And then her body is found about, uh, I think like 30 feet from his back door, his, his where he lived with his parents. Um, and she was stabbed to death. She was stabbed like 19 times, very violent murder. And, um, you know, so you, I mean, right off the bat, you're thinking, well, the boyfriend just got out of the psychiatric unit where he'd write her letters saying, please stay away from me when I get out. I don't want to kill you, literally. Uh, so he looks like a pretty good suspect. But then the next day, a lot of his friends and Lisa's friends go to the police and say, hey, can't be our friend. He's such a nice guy. It's got to be the weird kid in school, this Kevin Young who wore black and listened to Metallica and played D and D and just a weird kid. And, uh, these teens pointed the finger at him and, and the police latched onto him and, and never really let go, even though there was not a shred of evidence that ever linked Kevin to the crime scene. And we'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsors. Thanks to our sponsors. And now we're back to the program. The story unfolds in such a way where you're really absorbed in all of the lives of the families. And I think you did a really good job, like, magnifying how the community was uh, Im- impacted by this, uh, even down to the title of the book. Um, oh, thanks. Yeah, because you just mentioned, like, these teens got together and pointed the finger at this kid who's 
a weird kid dressed in black listens to Metallica D and D. I think all of us can think about can think of one person or at least one or two people that we went to school with that matches that description. And I wondered if I was in that situation, would I point my finger at that kid too? I mean. Or maybe that would have been me, you know? I think you just right. did a really great job, like, re- making it relatable because we all know someone like that. But where does that title come from? Yeah, the title is is from, um, it's part of a quote from The Crucible, the play The Crucible about the Salem witch trials, because I saw a lot of parallels with what, what happened in Shaker Heights then and the, the mass hysteria around Kevin Young. And uh, it comes from a a quote, and I'm paraphrasing, but we are as we always were in Salem, but now the little crazy children are holding the keys to the kingdom. And and I think that that fits here. A lot of the friends, a lot of these teens that were involved in this, these false accusations against Kevin Young that eventually led to his being arrested and tried for the crime. You know, they went on to very high positions. I already mentioned one got the the Pulitzer, uh, another became the law director, I think, of Seattle, or at least high in law enforcement in Seattle, and um, others became lawyers. And so they're they're in very powerful positions now. You know, and Kevin Kevin is dead because he drank himself to death because of the the shame of of what happened back then. Yeah which is really tragic uh, when you're describing that in the book again, because the way you describe it makes it relatable. We all know the person in our town that grew up to be that person to that had something happen in their lives that put them in that place. And then uh, I wanted to touch on, cause you just brought up the crucible and the crucible yeah. is like a parable for McCarthyism. And yeah. your book is kind of right in line with that. I mean, everyone lined up against this kid and there's the scene that plays out where he's being interrogated. What was it like writing that scene, knowing that these, you know, that parable, yeah, was intentional for you? Um, the interrogation was the one the the hardest part of the book, I think, to really delve into and write about because it was so devastating for him and and just the the just how out of bounds the police were with what they did to Kevin. They, they drove down, they wanted it to be Kevin so bad. And eventually they drove down and there's like a dozen cops drive down the Ohio state university where Kevin is now a freshman and they pull him out of his dorm and take him to a hotel room. And, interrogate him for 36 hours. I've never seen anything quite like it. Um, they During the course of those hours, and it begins, it doesn't begin until like, I don't know, 10 or 11 o'clock one night. And they stay up all through the night. They give him a lie detector test. Um, and, uh, you know, they give him over the course of, I, I think those 30 hours or whatever, um, they give him a couple lie detector tests and they're telling him he's he's failing these things, which is not true. Um, and uh, they 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 try to break Kevin Young and get him to confess to this crime, and he he never does, even though it affects him so much. He is then put into a, a mental health facility the next day. Wow! So thirty six hours of interrogation is that straight, or did he have a chance to sleep in between? He, they broke at one time for like two hours, two or three hours or something like that. I think maybe he got an hour worth of sleep before they started in on him again. And, um, and that went on through, I think most of the next day. And they, would they give him a bunch of caffeine too, to keep him awake? Oh yeah. Yeah. This whole time they're loading him up on caffeine and cigarettes and meals and anybody, you know, I, I had other, well, I actually went back to like the major, uh, there's a a lie detector consultant that works here in Akron, a couple couple miles away from where I live, and he was involved in this case back then. And I had their same team look through this, and he's and they're not the ones that administered the lie detector test. It was actually a police officer with Shaker Heights who administered the test, and these trained polygraph experts went back and looked at this and they're like, well, first of all, 
that test was like 75% fallible. You know, it, 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 it was worse than a coin flip as to whether or not, you know, to, you could tell somebody was guilty from it. It wasn't administered the way it was supposed to be. The, the technician wasn't doing the right things. It was just, it was a botched, um, series of, of lie detector tests for that. And so completely admissible, inadmissible, meaningless. Um, but they were threatening Kevin with, with this stuff. And then like the craziest thing happens after that interrogation where the police, even though he didn't break, even though he still maintained his innocence, they're like, well, we know it's him. We know it's got to be him. So they go to another consultant who was a psychiatrist or psychologist at the University of Syracuse, very popular um, consultant at the time for the FBI, a guy named Dr. Murray Myron. And they asked him, hey, um, how do we get Kevin to confess to this murder? And the first thing he says is, well, why are you guys looking at the boyfriend? I mean, the evidence against the boyfriend is much better than you have against Kevin. And they kind of, you know, wave their hands and they're like, yeah, yeah. Every, you know, all these kids are a little crazy. The boyfriend could be a viable suspect, but right now we're focused on Kevin. And then the psychologist says, well, if it's Kevin or not, here's how you get him to confess. And he goes on to talk about how to break Kevin's mind. And he uses phrases like, here's how you clockwork orange Kevin. And here's how you manipulate him to get the answer that you want. Um, I mean, it's just uh, inexcusable and in indefensible what they did to this, what they did to this kid. Did he have a lawyer present at all? Eventually he did get a lawyer. Um, and uh, his lawyer, his main lawyer, there's a guy named Mark Devan who came onto the case, and he's the one that takes the lead during the trial. Really smart defense lawyer. And, you know, he was very helpful. And once he became involved, you know, Shaker Heights police backed off a bit uh, because they couldn't get away with that stuff anymore. Um, what's interesting is Kevin's father uh, was also a lawyer. And if his, and his father, you know, the night of the murder, he says, I know Kevin didn't do it. He was with me. We were up until 1, 1 a.m. that night playing Nintendo. And uh, so his father was, he, he knew he didn't do it. So even though he was a lawyer, he allowed his son to be questioned by police because he's like, well, I know he didn't do it. And I trust the law. I trust the system. And, you know, that, of course, backfired magnificently. So everybody's like, why, why were the police so focused on Kevin? And one of the one of here's one reason they were. Um, so first, of all, you have these kids pointing the finger at Kevin. They're like, "All right." So they do a little digging. Here's one thing that everybody agrees on from the very beginning: whoever killed Lisa Pruitt had to know she was coming over to Dan Dryford's that night because she was going to ride her bike and meet and and sneak sneak over to his ha his house at about twelve thirty in the morning. And where she was found was in this quiet little corner, actually of the neighbor's backyard. It's the perfect place for like a makeout session or whatever. And um, whoever killed her was very obviously lying in wait. So when she came through the hedges um, after, after she was in that location is when she was murdered. So this wasn't a random act. Whoever did it had to know she was coming. And so that limits your your cast of characters that limits your potential suspects. Of course, the boyfriend knew about it, right? Well, he had a friend over that day. So this friend was actually dating his sister at the time. This guy's name was Tex. And at one point in the evening before Lisa came over, he sent Tex into Shaker Square, which is this little shopping district, I, I don't know, like a mile or two away from his house. Tex rides his bike to pick up cigarettes for Dan. And while he's at the square, he stops in at this coffee shop called Arabica. And um, at Arabica is Kevin Young, who is also a friend of Dan's and Texas at the time. And so he sits down and just talks with Kevin for a little while. And during the course of the conversation, it comes up that Lisa's sneaking out of her house. So when police heard that, they're like, oh, my gosh, everybody's pointing the finger at Kevin. And Kevin knew Lisa was going to be there. So he must have done it. And um, so that kind of is one of the reasons why they focused on him 
so heavily. But there were a number of other people that knew Lisa was sneaking out. Um, Dan had called a number of his friends. Remember this the day he got out of the mental hospital where he had been for a month. So he called a couple of other friends. He's like, hey, come over to my house, sneak out. We'll, we'll have a robo party tonight. And uh, robo party is short for <laughs> Robitussin. Yeah. Uh, wow. Uh, yeah. I, 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 I don't ever remember any of my friends doing this, but apparently it was pretty common in the 80s and early 90s because Robitussin you could buy over the counter at the time and it had the like the good stuff, the codeine and stuff that right. if you chugged half a bottle, it would make you trip like LSD. And uh, so yeah. that's that's a lot, though. I, <laughs> like I knew LSD. people that would do that. Yeah, I think I was too young to uh, partake in any robo parties or anything. <laughs> yeah, me too. Me too. Uh, but apparently, it was a thing that that he liked to do. And uh, but then later on, he says that, and these friends come forward, and they're like, e they said each and every one of there were about three. They they said at first they all said, yeah, we'll come over, and then later when questioned by police, they're like, oh no no no, I had work to do, so I just didn't go over. So you know, depending on who you believe these other people canceled on him and the only person that come over was, was Lisa. You mentioned that Dan was in a psychiatric hospital for a month. What was he in there for? Yeah, that's interesting too. So his father at the time was in charge of the pediatric uh, department at the Cleveland clinic. And he pulled strings in order to get his son committed into, into that um, psychiatric unit. And when asked on the stand during the trial, why he had a son committed, it basically came down to his son was arguing about his bedtime. And you get into it a little deeper, you, you see that the father and the son were butting heads a lot. The father was kind of a control freak. And, um, you know, it depends on what you believe, but it sure looks like this was just a disgruntled father who wanted to show who was in charge and uh, threw his kid in a psychiatric unit for a month. And one of the things that kind of got under my skin in the book is, and in like a uncomfortable way, not like a creepy way or anything like that, <laughs> the, the letters that were exchanged between Lisa and Dan while he was while he was in the institution. Can you just, yeah. without giving you know too much info, can you elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah, uh, they wrote back and forth almost on a daily basis, or at least she wrote to him almost on a daily basis. Dan would write back every once in a while. And, uh, you know, these letters are crazy. Like In one letter, he talks about this vision he has of his father coming to see him and then him physically assaulting his father to the point that, um, he busts in his teeth or something, and he needs medical attention. Uh, he talks about this pent-up rage that he has inside of him. And um, there's one point where he directly tells Lisa, you know, please, this place has changed me. Please stay away from me when I get out. I don't want to kill you. Um, I mean, these are very aggressive, you know, self-hate sort of, sort of letters. And while those words are in the letters, was there any part of you that could relate to him? You know, on, that's a very good question. Of course. Yeah. I mean, you look back at when you're a teenager and you've got these very powerful emotions. And when you fall in love, you fall in love hard and um, it's all consuming. Um, and you've got a lot of shame and self-doubt. And I mean, it's just I wouldn't want to be a teenager again. Um, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I don't know that I would have ever in my life written a note saying, um, I'm afraid that I might kill you. That's a little extreme. But I can I can I can totally see that there was a lot of angst there. And both Dan and Lisa were creative people, and creative people um get wrapped up in their feelings a lot more than than, you know, typical people. Um, he was he was a, a musician and a singer and in this rock and roll band. So I think to an extent he was enjoying that, you know, type of life, that over emotional type of persona. I just can't believe like the title of this book is perfect. Um, Thanks. <laughs> because um, I can't believe these kids, you know, 16 to 18, I guess, were were into what they were into. Um yeah, I, I don't know. It seems seems crazy. 
um, so much drugs, uh, sex, mental institution. That's crazy. And then murder. Um, all that in in this group of kids that are like 16. Like, I, you know, I was around in 1990. I was 10 years old in 1990. No, in, not in my wildest imagination could I... Could I conceive that me and my friends were up to these kind of things at 16? Like, I, it's, it's shocking. Yeah, for sure. I think it was partly a product of the time, um, you know, this is before the internet, before a lot of, you know, um, f- distractions. So, you know, you spent your days hanging out with each other and you formed really close bonds. And um, they had anything they could have desired. You know, these are the kids of, you know, they, they were part of a clique they called the AP Posse because they were all in advanced placement classes. So they were intelligent. They had the run of the school. They had no wants for money or or things. And, you know, they, they could do pretty much whatever they wanted to do. And, um, you know, the parents were so busy with their careers that they weren't really aware of what was going on at, in these mansions. Uh, when they weren't home mansions my god we were stealing clothes from abercrombie that was about the worst (laughs) thing that we were doing at that age (laughs) well this has been recorded so um, oh shit yeah careful (laughs) (laughs) mr moneybags over here sneaking the abercrombie to steal the clothes (laughs) (laughs) i i uh i grew up on a farm surrounded by cornfields and the closest uh, uh restaurant was about 30 miles away um, so we, we couldn't get into that. We were, we were, uh, there are a lot of, um, riding bikes and setting off firecrackers and having, yeah. you know, bottle rocket wars. Well, one thing that like, I really truly admire about your work is like, you're, you don't care about getting personal and it really adds to the story. I don't know. Maybe you do care about getting personal, but you put it in anyway and it really adds <laughs> right? to the story and you do get personal in part three when you say why you decided to take this on after it had been sort of dormant for so long in your professional you know, career and it's personal. And then you tell the story about your, your son and daughter and the, how you almost lost them. And I don't have kids, but I was like gut wrenched at that. That was oh. an insane story. Thank you. You know, there was a conversation um, by one of the copy editors about taking that out because they couldn't quite understand how it fit in with the larger story. That was the one thing I thought to kept keep in because uh, it, to me, I, I'm like, uh, this totally explains what it would be like to, to lose a kid. Um, and luckily, you know, so here's the story. Um, I, uh, you know, this was back when my daughter was, um, I think she was about one years old, which would have been made Casey, my son, about six. And uh, we uh, lived in this house. We had this garage. And um, every time I pulled, I, I, I was driving a Subaru Forester. And um, every time uh, we would pull in, I have my space for the Subaru. And my wife has her space for her car. And um, so we always park in the same place, which becomes kind of important later on. And um, behind our garage in our neighbor's backyard is this giant oak tree that has to be like 250 years old. And it had this big canopy, you know, these giant leaves and it looked healthy. Um, And one day I came home with my kids and it was right after like a crazy downpour. It had like just dumped a ton of water on Akron and uh, Julie was elsewhere. So it was me and the two kids and I pull in and I I can't tell you why I, cause I'm a creature of habit, but I parked my Subaru in the other space, the space closer to the house that day. Uh, It makes no sense in, in retrospect. I've never done that even when the, the other space was empty but I parked in the other space and that made all the difference, I'm sure. But um, so I park and Lainey's in my daughter's in the in the in a child seat in the back and Casey's in the other back seat because he's six. So I, I get out of the car. Casey gets out of his his side and I walk around to get Lainey out of her car seat. 
And as I open her door, I hear what sounds like a train jumping the tracks. And we had a train, we had train tracks up at the top of the hill. And my first thought was, oh my God, a freight train has jumped the tracks and is rolling down the hill. Um, and I look back and Casey's pointing up into the sky and I, I follow his, where he's pointing and I see the, this giant oak tree is coming down, not like a branch, but the whole tree is falling towards us. And I realize there's, I can't get Lane out of the car seat and away from this before it comes down on us. And so, you know, Casey dives into the stairwell where you can get into our basement. And my instinct kicks in and I just think I got to do what little I can here. And so I climb on the side of the Subaru and, and put my arms up to try to brace this, you know, however many tons oak tree. And it just comes down and it hits me with such a force that it knocks me out. Um, I'm sure for like maybe 10 seconds, couldn't have been longer than that. And I wake up and I'm, I've been blown about 15 feet. I'm laying on the ground propped against the, the porch and I had a diaper bag on me and it is shredded. It is, it is completely broken apart from my body and it is shredded. And I look up and I don't see anything but the canopy of the tree. And I think that, that Subaru is smashed flat. And there was just this, I mean, a total, uh, feeling of loss. And I remember hearing me shouting no in this just guttural voice before I realized I was making a sound and, um, just, just anguish. And I start, uh, peeling back the canopy and I find the Subaru and she's fine. Um, I, uh, she's in this little pocket of the Subaru that was unharmed, but there's a giant tree branch that's gone through the, the windshield, the front windshield. Um, I've got pictures of this still. I could, I could show you cause it's nuts. Um, where Casey was sitting, there's another branch that's just poking into his seat. He would have been gone. Um, and then we were all fine. You know, I got, and Lainey's just sitting there in this pocket with like wide eyes and she's not even crying. And I pick her up and, uh, I make sure Casey's okay. And we go over to the neighbors and I just like, I'm sobbing. I'm like, please take her, um, you know, just keep her in the house. So I know she's safe. And, uh, yeah, it was nuts. So, you know, when I talk about this case, you know, part of what I have to do is discuss what it's like in some ways to lose a child, you know, because Lisa was 16 years old at the time. And, you know, you try to put yourselves in the, you know, her parents' position, what it be, what it would be like. And, you know, I, I, I can only say I know what it felt like for five seconds. And it was the worst five seconds of my life. Yeah. It's stunning. Jeez. Just a yeah. stunning moment. My God. <laughs> yeah. I, it, it affected me for quite a while. Um, you know, I, I was overprotective of, of Lane for, for a while after that. And, um, you know, I just, I had to, f I had to make a concerted effort to stop, uh, picturing it because that's what my mind wanted to do. It wanted to replay that whole incident to like make sense of it. And at, at, at some point you just have to like, nope, I'm done done seeing that again and just and just move on but uh yeah tough to move on cuz the randomness of it right seemingly healthy tree just pulling in the driveway everyday movements that you're you've gone through the randomness of it you have to get beyond that cuz then you'll just you'll end up being a shut in right or like why did i park in that other space yeah. if i had parked in the space i parked at 99% of the time it would the the Subaru definitely would have been flat because it completely destroyed the garage like just turned it into tinder um so uh yeah why did i park in the other space that day you know it's 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 weird and the, yeah the randomness will get you will make you crazy because you know things like that happen you realize that you know no matter how well you take care of yourself you know <laughs> a giant oak tree could fall on you tomorrow 
Yeah, yeah. And you've you've never turned your back on Subaru since. Right. <laughs> Loyal Subaru customer. Uh, you know that you're joking, but that's totally true. I'll never, you know, <laughs> yeah. I I went directly. I'm like, they're like, well, that's totaled. What kind of vehicle do you want? And I'm like, Subaru Forester, of course. How about how about the same brand that <laughs> saved my daughter's life? <laughs> right, right. And we'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsors. Thanks to our sponsors, and now we're back to the program. Well. Who do you think is the best suspect and why? Can you take us through that? Yeah. So, you know, like I said, I got a couple weeks into the research and uh, started seeing this name pop up again and again in the reports. And this this kid's name was David Brannigan. And I found that they had given David Brannigan a lie detector test, too. And I'm like, oh, that's strange. Why would you give this guy? You know, who is he and why would he need a lie detector test? And so I looked into it, and um, David Brand again um, went to the police uh, the day after the murder and said, hey, you know, I was at a bus stop on Lee Road, which is where the crime occurred, and um, there was this black man at the bus stop, and he mentioned Lisa's murder in the murders of the porters, and I wonder if he might be responsible for all, for all three. And uh, such a weird statement. In the police, you know, very obviously this this kid was trying to say he thought this black man was responsible for these murders. And um, that's when I learned about the the double homicide that occurred on that same block five years before Lisa was murdered. Um, there was a double homicide uh, that occurred eight doors north of where Dan Dreifert lived, and this was uh, Philip Porter who was in his 80s, and his wife, Dorothy Porter, who I believe was maybe in her 70s. And Philip Porter was the former executive editor at The Plain Dealer, our daily paper here. And his wife was uh, an artist and of some renown, too. Her, her, uh, some of her sketches are at the museum here. Um, and they, um, one Friday night in 1985, somebody broke into their house and stabbed Philip to death in his bed and stabbed Dorothy downstairs and then uh, strangled her with an, the cord of her iron uh, to finish her off and uh, didn't take any money. There's money out. Um, so it was this unsolved homicide. But, you know, I didn't think too much of the Porter's case for a while because when I started looking into it just a couple years ago, there was a guy sitting in prison for the Porter's murders. This uh, guy named Donnie Soki had confessed to their murders. So I just looked at it as a closed case. Anyways, the David Brannigan starts popping up and he's the one that went to the police. And the, so the police thought that was weird. And they're like, well, where were you the night of the murder? And uh, he said, well, he had dropped off his girlfriend and then walked home. And uh, he walked past the scene and then described in detail the two officers and the one part that was not in the papers, their, their uh, dog. They had a canine unit. And so he described in detail how these two officers were, at, were looking at the scene of, of the murder with the, with the dog. So we know he was there, but the police never saw him. And these are two officers that just arrived at a homicide scene. So they're at like heightened awareness, right? Which means David is hiding and he's watching these police. And they don't see him. So that's weird. He says he goes home and his mom's awake and he talks to her and then goes and takes a shower. Well, the police followed up on that. It turns out her, his mom was not awake, that he, he lied about that part. Uh, David, David Brannigan also has a pretty big knife collection. He likes to collect hunting knives. So I started thinking about this and uh, looked into it a little deeper. Now, one of the things reasons, like I said, the police were so invested in Kevin Young as a suspect is because he was at that Arabica coffee shop when Tex arrived and told him that Lisa was sneaking out. Well, there's one other person in the Arabica coffee shop at that time that would have overheard that conversation, and that was David Brannigan. So I started looking into him, and I went to his girlfriend, who was his alibi that night, 
And she, it was like, she was, she was waiting for somebody to contact her all these years. She's like, first of all, I'm not an alibi. She said, because when he dropped me off, he had plenty of time to walk to that scene and intercept Lisa before she was murdered. And I, I forgot to mention this, but Brannigan lives on Sedgwick Road, which runs parallel to Lee. He lives on the road behind where the murder occurred. So that's where he was heading home. And then I find out that David Brannigan passed away in 2017. Coincidentally, he dies the same way Kevin Young did. He drank himself to death. And uh, so I go to the next person I talk to is his common law wife and um, who you know, they had a daughter together. And I figured she was going to slam the door in my face, but she invited me in. She was very nice. We talked for a while and she talked about how over the years he would sometimes mention the Lisa Pruitt case and he would mention the Porter's homicide. Oh, she also said that, you know, in I heard this from a number of his girlfriends that he, he confessed to them that he was breaking into homes on that block. And he would break into these homes and he wouldn't steal money, but he would steal like jewelry or little trinkets. It was kind of like how he got a high, right? It, it was thrilling to him. And uh, he collected these things in a box and he would sometimes show his girlfriends this, this box of things that he had stolen. So eventually I get around to asking her, I said, do you think it's possible he killed Lisa? Do you think it's possible he killed the porters? And she said, uh, well, let me tell you this. He said, when, she, when, he was a, when he was in preschool, a boy pushed him down on the playground and he didn't say anything. But lunch, lunchtime came around and he made a point to sit next to this boy. And when the boy wasn't looking, he poured Comet Cleaner in the kid's sandwich. She said, that's David Brannigan. That's the way he was his whole life. So I pulled the Porter's homicide records and there's a witness for the murders, uh, that um, actually three young men who broke into the house, uh, the property next door to the Porters the night of the murder. They said they had broken in to set off fireworks. And the, the, main, the main kid of the three, the leader, was David Brannigan himself. And he told police when they questioned him um, that he saw a black man running out of the porter's back door, and that must have been the killer. Now, that's impossible because the the door was locked from the inside. Um, the killer came in through the kitchen window and left that way. Brannigan's the one commonality between all three murders. Um, but again, you've got that guy sitting in prison for confessing to the crime, right? So I look at how at his confession, and he has the story about how he and his father um, and this guy named Danny Crawford decided one night to go rob somebody in Shaker Heights. And so they drove into Shaker. Danny parked on the street and he and, and um, Donnie and his father went in to kill the porters. Why? Because his father was part of the Hells Angels gang and Philip Porter ran the plane dealer in the 60s and ran some bad stories about the Hells Angels. That was his motive, if you if you believe it. And um, but anybody from Shaker Heights can tell you how this is impossible because he says his driver, Danny Crawford, was sitting on Lee Road for a half an hour while they went in and killed the porters. Well, to this day, there is no parking on Lee Road. It's a very busy four lane stretch that takes you through the, you know, to, to Cleveland Heights and beyond. Um, and if you're a couple hillbillies from, you know, outside of Shaker Heights in a, in a, jalopy and you park on on lee road the cops are going to be on you in like five seconds you there's no way you're going to be sitting there for a half an hour so it's impossible and eventually i do come to be friends with donnie soki and he's sitting in prison for 888 years and um and eventually he does tell me he's like yeah he's like i confess to this i didn't do it i wanted better accommodations in prison and this cop gave me a sweetheart deal and he's like a career confessor. Yeah, yeah. He's confessed to a number of crimes that he that he did not commit because, you know, that there's there's a lot of reasons for it. But eventually it became that he wanted better accommodations. And this this detective that uh, helped him work this deal for for confessing to the Porter's homicide has put thousands and thousands of dollars on his commissary account 
It just makes his life easier. He knows he's not getting out. He doesn't want to get out at this point. So he just wants an easy life in, in, in prison. So do you think that this murder of Lisa Pruitt will ever, do you think there'll ever be answers here? They can test the evidence. Nobody's testing the evidence. It's just sitting there. Um, you know, they were so sure it was, was Kevin, they weren't interested in looking at anybody else, but they have a fingerprint from the crime scene that they, they just, they were interested to see if it matched Kevin. And as soon as it didn't, they, they're like, well, well, it must be somebody else that has nothing to do with the murder. Um, so they could see if that fingerprint matches Brannigan's, uh, his fingerprints are on file because he was arrested a number of times. Um, for other stuff, you know, they, they have evidence in the Porter's murders that they, you know, they have the, the iron cord that the killer had to hold the DNA's on there. Um, there's a number of things that could yield DNA. They just have to test it. And it's, I can't get anybody to like, it, it opens up a can of worms because you've got somebody sitting in prison for the Porter's murders and they've, they've sold their soul to like convince everybody that Kevin Young killed Lisa Pruitt. And, they just, uh, I think eventually, you know, I think eventually they'll do it. I just wish it was sooner than than later. Well, uh, yeah, James Renner, this has been a a really great conversation um, discussing your book, uh, Little Crazy Children. It's such a great book. Where Thank is uh, the best place for our uh, our audience to pick up a copy? Well, best place would be your local bookstore, and if if they don't have it there, tell them to order twenty more copies. But if you get your stuff online, uh, you know, you can find it anywhere online, Amazon, what have you. It's available as an audio book. Um, and, you know, it took me a while to convince publishers to allow me to do my own audio books. But um, they've let me do it for the last couple and I get to do this one. So it's an audio book. It's for Kindle. You know, however you get your uh, your medicine, you know. <laughs> I was going to make a robo joke, but I'm <laughs> very bad taste.